Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the next session of our Copernicus Earth Observation Data Visualization Workshop series. That's quite a mouthful. Um, I'm Haley Evers King here from UMETSAT, and I'll be your host today for our session on oceans and sea ice. Um, I'm great to see so many people joining us. Um, just to give you a little bit of time for you all to come in, uh, I'll just set up my slides and then we'll get started. OK, you should all be seeing my slides now. If there's any problems, just let us know in chat and someone will sort out any technical issues that we're having. Um, so welcome again to our Oceans and uh, Sea Ice session of our um, Data Visualization Workshop series. Uh, just a few bits of housekeeping uh, before we start. I'll go through um, our panelists and our agenda for today in a second. If you're interested in asking questions during the course of our workshop, you can use the Slido link that's going to be placed in chat, or you can go to slido.com and use the hashtag EODataViz with a Z. Um, and you can ask your questions there um, about anything to do with Earth observation, the oceans and sea ice and any specific questions of our panelists. And we'll come to ask answer questions at a couple of points uh, during the workshop. So who do we have with us today? First of all, you'll get a general introduction, a little bit of background on the topic of ocean earth observation and data visualization from myself. That'll be quite short before I hand over to the first of our panelists, Fabrice Massal from Mercator Ocean International. Uh, Fabrice will be followed by Olivier Montbrief from Meteo France, um, Scientific Communication Outreach Officer, and then Ada Alvira Ascarate from the University of Liège. We'll then break after our first set of talks for a Q&A um, session. And then we'll be back with a discussion about Sentinel-1 data and oil spill detection from Giovanni Coppini from CMCC. And following that, we'll have Vittorio Brando joining us to talk about water stability and what happened um, in Venice during the coronavirus pandemic. And lastly, we'll get to some practical examples of tools and different approaches you can use for visualizing Copernicus ocean data from Ben Loveday from Innerflare. And we'll finish up again with some Q&A time. So please do put your questions in the Slido as we go through today. We'll be very happy to answer your questions now um, during the um, different sessions. And we can also uh, contact you afterwards. We'll tell you different places where you can get in touch with us uh, to have more questions answered after today. So let's get started with my brief introduction. Why are we here today? Why do we care about the oceans? We live on land. So sometimes this is a fair question, I think. What, what do the oceans have to do with us? And there's many, many powerful stories, I think, that have been told about the oceans using Earth observation. But most of it comes down to the fact that the oceans really do impact our day to day lives, whether we are traveling on them, working on them and shipping, whether we are swimming in them on holiday or whether we are eating food that comes from them. Or if indeed we are influenced by the weather that the oceans play a huge role in. Oceans really have an important role in our everyday lives. And as a result of this, we have Earth observation techniques that allow us to observe what is going on in the oceans. And these have very direct, societally relevant applications. And this is why I get to do the job that I do and why UMETSAT flies these kind of satellites. So everything from maritime safety um, to looking at pollution to supporting fisheries and aquaculture to understanding the interplay between our oceans and climate. Satellite data can really help us to understand all these different ways that the ocean impacts our lives. So what are our Earth observation options for visualizing oceans and sea ice? You saw a couple of them mentioned in that previous slide, altimetry, SAR, ocean color, SST. These are satellite measurements and we get derived products from them. Uh, for some of you, this may be very familiar, but for those of you who come maybe more from the journalism or data science side, I wanted to give you a bit of a 101 about um, ocean earth observation before we get started. You'll hear more from our individual speakers. Um, so we have level one data. This is where you're seeing things like visible and thermal radiometry. We have microwave data and we have radar signals. Uh, I've also put in brackets here that we have gravity data available as well from satellites and laser based information as well, though this is less the experience of myself and my colleagues who will be in the workshop today, uh, but just so you know, those are out there. So you can visualize this kind of data. You can also visualize data from what we call level two. And this is where all those different signals that I've mentioned are processed into geophysical products. So variables we might recognize about the oceans in this case. So it might be chlorophyll, it might be temperature. Uh, this is where we convert a signal into an actual product that quantifies some particular property, and that can be visualized too. 
at level three and level four, we take these different satellite data products, we merge them, we regrid them, we may gap fill them and add further value added geophysical products as well. So this is also data that can be visualized. And in fact, for certain applications, this is the type of data you want to work with because it allows you to look over long time periods. I should note here that this data is all available at various timeliness levels. So depending on your story you wanna tell, you might be wanting to work with data that's available really quickly as soon as possible, or you might be wanting to work with long time series. So this is an important thing I think to keep in mind when we're talking about how to visualize uh, information about our oceans and sea ice. Satellite data isn't the only thing when we talk about Earth observation. A lot of satellite data also feeds into what we call reanalysis and model outputs. And these um, data sets can be used to bring real uh, different dimensions and different perspectives to the stories we want to tell because they can look just not just at the surface, they can look beyond uh, what is going on at ocean depth into future and into the past as well. So let's look at a bit more depth at those. The first one I mentioned was visible optical, and this might be the data that some of you are most familiar with. It tends to look like a picture that we would recognize with our eyes. You can see one example of what we call a true color image on the right hand side there. Uh, in the ocean sense, this is often referred to as ocean color uh, measurements. Um, these are measurements of light across the visible part of the wavelength. So this is what we can see with our eyes. And because it's based upon this type of light measurement, we can only get it during the day. It's available though at kind of these individual color bands. So it's kind of like having a really good set of eyes that are designed to look at different colors over a very, very dark target if you're using an ocean color sensor. We can also use optical imagery from other missions that are not designed specifically for the oceans. And you have to make some considerations um, when you use those. We can talk more about that later during the course of the workshop. So you can make a true color kind of picture image using this kind of data, as you can see on the right there, to visualize what's going on in the ocean. But there's actually a lot more information hidden in the specific bands as well. And this is what the level two products that we mentioned before really take advantage of. So you can also calculate different things and look at specific parts of the color spectrum to extract specific information and tell specific stories. Then we have thermal radiometry and I've put microwave in here as well, even though they're different types of measurement. But from an ocean perspective, the use of these types of Earth observation technology, the main objective really is to derive the sea surface temperature as well as sea ice surface temperature and information about ice characteristics. This information also exists at these multiple wavelengths within the electromagnetic spectrum, but it can be made measurements made at day and at night using certain bands, depending on where you are in the spectrum. Uh, and microwave can also be used to see through clouds, but it does tend to be coarser resolution. So you can start visualizing things like these beautiful features you see in the Gulf Stream, uh, these eddies uh, in the image in this slide. We'll hear mention of radar data later today in different contexts. Um, we're talking here mainly about what we call synthetic aperture radar. So this is different to the other methods where a signal is emitted in this case and it bounces off a surface and returns back to us and we collect what we call these echoes. And that's the level one data that we mean uh, when we talk about synthetic aperture radar. Now this technique has two main uses in an ocean context. We have um, um, SAR altimetry, which is what's available on Sentinel-3 and 6 that I work with, where we're taking these very narrow along track measurements for really precise estimation of things about the sea surface, like the sea surface height, significant wave height and wind speed. Those are the geophysical products you get at level two from this data. Um, we also have SAR imaging, and this is what you'll see from Sentinel-1, and there's an example there in the slide. Uh, this is where you get wider swath images, and the signal there can be linked with things like oil spills, ship and infrastructure detection, waves and parameters around ice as well. Some general things then to consider when we're talking about visualizing the ocean from space. I would say to consider your resolution. What's the spatial resolution? How often are you getting images? How long are you getting images for? What's the spectral resolution? If it's a electromagnetic visible to thermal infrared um, data set you're using. And how are these relative to the thing that you're interested in telling a story about? Do they capture it properly? Um, similarly, is the data that you're seeing, is, is the signal you're looking, is it real? Is it representative? Are the changes between images you look at an actual change? What has changed? And I think for the ocean, this is a particularly important point because the ocean is dynamic. It moves. It's kind of dark and mysterious. Um, you know, if you look at an image of a city one day and you see a building is gone the next day, 
you can be pretty sure that building probably is gone. But with the ocean, it might be that the satellite was looking at a different angle or the ocean has moved or the atmosphere has changed. It's a little bit more um, mysterious in terms of detecting things like change. Um, is the product the appropriate one? Are we using the right algorithm to detect the thing you're interested in? Has the data been flagged? Are things hidden um, as a result of what we can and can't see under cloud, for example? Um, so you have to kind of consider these things, I think, when you're visualizing different things about the ocean. And I think this is particularly important as well when we look at things like time series. So if we're talking about climate and extreme events, placing them in the appropriate time context um, so that you can be sure you're identifying something that is related to a particular phenomena is quite challenging. But we'll hear more about this in examples this week and in the coming weeks as well. So those are my quick like tips about the oceans and Earth observation. Um, and I would leave you for the rest of the session with just one statement saying really, you know, the oceans are a really vast and vital part of the functioning of our planet, but they're, they're often really distant from us as land dwelling beings. But the importance of them in terms of things like our climate and how we rely on them in terms of food production really can't be overstated. But Earth observation offers us a fantastic way to share the stories of this distant but very important part of our planet. So I'd really encourage you to do that. And um, with that, I can hand over to the first of our um, speakers today, which is Fabrice. Fabrice, are you there with us? Yes, thank, thank you, Eli, for this introduction. I'm very pleased to be here with you today. Um, I would share my screen. I would like to thank the organizer of the UMEDSA teams for this series of, of webinars. Very, very interesting. Uh, so my name is Fabrice Messal. I work for Mercator Ocean International, which is a non-profit organization specialized in uh, 3D ocean modeling. And we are the interested entity by the European Commission to implement the Copernicus Marine Service. Uh, so I work in the markets and service department and my team is leading the development of front end tools, viewers and capacity development activities. Um, and since I started to work for Mercator Ocean International as an engineer, I'm still working on data visualization in different kinds of activities. So in my presentation, I will give you a general overview of these activities and the material we produce and use in the frame of the uh, Copernicus uh, Marine Service uh, with a focus on model data, not only uh, as observation data. Uh, so is it working? Yeah. So a few words to start about the Copernicus Marine Service, which is uh, the European service dedicated for uh, marine products. Uh, there is a, a, an online catalog with uh, uh, more than 300 scientifically qualified products. Um, this is really a, a, the single access point to access to all this information on the global scale, on the uh, European regional basins about the blue ocean, what we call the blue ocean with physical parameter, uh, the green ocean with uh, biogeochemical uh, information and the white ocean on sea ice uh, information. And we try to give access to all these data. This is an open and free services, so you have just to register and access the product, but also to uh, give access to information, uh, indicators, and also viewers uh, to allow people uh, to, 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 to take their own decision and to dive into the data. Uh, all the data have a single uh, format, which is an ETDF, but uh, several um, data access protocols are available to access the data. Uh, and I hope I will have time to uh, make you a short demo of the uh, visualization tool. Uh, so I try to summarize some of all the fields of activity we have at Copernicus Marine Service related to data visualization, which came to my mind in this table. Um, but first of all, there are many criteria to assess a good data visualization. And for my experience, I will retain first the audience you want to reach. You need to adapt your work following the, the level of knowledge of the targets. Uh, it's uh, very important. Secondly, the story, the message you want to tell with your visualization. And we can have two cases, or the data visualization speaks for itself, or it serves a story. In both cases, uh, the, the meaning and the efficiency are very important. Third point, the graphical and design quality. This criteria is very important in many cases. If you need to publish on social media, you have just few seconds to hook your audience. So you have to be innovative, creative, 
And if you need to produce a visualization for a poster a report, you need to take care of the resolution, the color palette, the legend. With my background in numerical magic, I can say that uh, sometimes I'm very critical on data visualization quality found on social media. And the fourth point is uh, shareability. We are not the end user of this kind of uh, products, uh, which is why shareability is an essential factor for us to disseminate this information. I could have also mentioned other criteria such, such as uh, integrity and accuracy of the data, which is, so, is also very important. But as I am using data from the Copernicus Marine Service, which is uh, scientifically pro, uh, qualified products, it's secondary for me. Um, so yes, on this table, sorry, on this table, so you see the different uh, activity, uh, communication, outreach, science, operations with different kind of targets and different objectives and the material can be common but you need to adapt your maps your plots your viewers your dashboards to the target you want to uh, to access to attend. Um, and to illustrate this uh, we'll start with communication material so in communication uh, we can have several objectives like uh, we want to illustrate an article or even more, uh, data visualization can be the central point of an article, a trend, uh, a new map on a new products. And uh, notice that on the website of Copernicus, we have a, a dedicated section for news uh, with a lot of data visualization to illustrate article. Uh, there are a few examples of maps and plots used on recent article to illustrate the new record on sea surface temperature. Uh, for example, on the uh, right side, uh, a map on the marine heat wave category uh, at the global scale. Um, in communication, we can also have a different objective, which is just to uh, simply showcase our products. Uh, it can be to illustrate a home page of a website. It can be on the, on the screen, in the stand, uh, at a conference. So in that case, uh, we will give priority to the design and the, the innovative way to, to show the, the products. And we are looking for the wow effect. Uh, what is that? What is representing? We, we try to hold the audience uh, with that. So this is example of animations we produce uh, we can have today 4K or 8K in resolution for the biggest screen uh, you can you can find. Uh, rise the awareness of the general public is also part of our DNA. We worked with aquarium, science centers, and museum to develop um, uh, content, and we have developed uh, tactile applications for uh, this kind of uh, outreach event uh, or participation. And today, a web version is accessible, uh, available on the website of the Copernicus Marine uh, Service. It's very interesting, um, and it's to, to work with people uh, in museum aquariums, exhibition producers or, or mediators, um, because you can learn how to tell a story with them, how to get straight to the point and use new innovative material like uh, virtual reality glasses. Uh, so it's very exciting uh, each time we uh, they come to us to propose us to, to participate to an, a new exhibition. Uh, in outreach material, we, have, we can have specific targets such as journalists or decision makers. And for them, we need to create um, data visualizations that can make sense of complex data and be ready, ready to use. Uh, that's why we have on the website a series of ocean monitoring indicators uh, available uh, directly on the website. They represent essential variable uh, monitoring the health of the ocean. You can find plots, trends, they are accessible, shareable, downloadable, and also the data uh, used to product them are accessible. So it means that you can download directly the, the data and uh, reproduce um, the, the, the plots uh, with your, your own uh, uh, needs. Um, 
and to share a condensed information about the state of the ocean, uh, we produce also um, data visualization uh, for a ocean state report. The communication team and scientists publish an annual report, uh, which provides a comprehensive and state-of-the-art assessment of the state of the global ocean and European regional seas for the scientific uh, community, as well as for policy and decision makers. In that case, uh, data visualizations are produced carefully to be accurate and understandable. Then uh, we have uh, developed other uh, kind of tool um, to explain how to use the data of the Copernicus Marine Service. We animate several training workshops per year and we develop tutorial material accessible on the website like Jupyter Notebooks uh, or a video tutorial on uh, QGIS uh, platform. You can find a dedicated plugin uh, to easily access the NetCDF data uh, from QGIS, for example, and many Jupyter Notebooks uh, using different products to produce visualizations. And all the codes are accessible uh, on the on the website. So it's very it's a, it's a lot of work to do that uh, with scientists, but uh, it works very very well. And people are very interested to have this piece of codes to to make their own illustration. Uh, and today, with uh, viewers, uh, you can directly access data and information uh, to explore insight, increase speed of decision making. Uh, so, as I said, my team is leading the development and the update of these viewers. Uh, we have on, on the left the Myation Learn, which is a web version of the tactile application. It's a perfect tool to discover ocean data uh, with animation on the globe. Uh, a new version with new features and stories will come soon. The MyOcean Viewer Pro on the uh, right side of the screen is our flagship viewer, uh, allowing users to dive and display data from the catalog. But not only, they can play with the data, share, download graphs and maps. Uh, we regularly add new features to meet users' needs, and we are preparing the next generation because in the future, dashboards and viewers uh, feeded by the future uh, digital twin ocean will accelerate uh, the access uh, uh, to a tailored information and should increase the speed of decision making and open up data visualization capabilities to a new uh, user communities. Um, so to finish, I would like to share my screen on the website to, to make a short demo of this uh, MyOcean Viewer Pro. Uh, don't forget that data visualization is key in our digital uh, digitalized world, and it will become more and more important. And the only uh, the only limit to that is your imagination. Okay, uh, so I will stop sharing this presentation. Okay, so now. Can you see my screen? Should I share again my screen? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so quickly, uh, this is the Copernicus Marine website with access uh, to the different catalog and products. And here you have the visualization tool uh, with the, diff the access to the different viewers. Uh, this is the Myation Learn with animation on the sea eyes. You have just a few variables and you can play with it. You can zoom in, zoom out. It's, and you can have a short story to understand why is it important to monitor this variable in particular. Uh, and then I have the MyOcean Pro. So this is our viewer uh, to access all the data from the catalog. So you have just to, to click and choose the, the correct data. And then you can play with the data with the timeline. You can dive into the past, into the future for some 10-day uh, uh, forecast uh, model. Uh, and you can uh, also play with uh, the data, the graphic, uh, the color map. Here I can change the color map. And you can directly access information and different graphs on the evolution of this uh, parameter uh, following the time or the death. Here you can see the graph of 
the profile at this point. So it's very powerful and in the future it will be more uh, with uh, uh, fast access to the data and a lot of new features. Uh, so don't hesitate to, uh, to take a moment to, to, to see that. Uh, to, to finalize my presentation, just uh, a quick demo. So I have this map. I'm very happy with that. Uh, I would like to share this map with AD. No problem. I can share directly the link or I can download the image, share the image directly. I can also create a video uh, to share uh, this uh, information with my community. So thank you for watching the, my presentation. Uh, now I let the floor to Ailey and uh, the ocean experts who will provide relevant examples on the different ocean related topics. Thank you very much. Thank you very much Fabrice there for sharing some really great tips and hints about what sort of things to use for which types of communication and also the vast array of products that are available from the room. Green service. Um, if anyone has any questions for Fabrice, please pop them in the Slido. After our next two talks, we'll come back and do a Q&A session with Fabrice. Thanks again, Fabrice. Um, next up, we have Olivier Montbrie from Meteo France. Olivier, are you there? Yes. Can you hear me? I hope so. Yes, I can. Wonderful. Okay, okay. the floor is yours. Please feel free to share your screen. Sure. I'll try to do that. Uh, um... Now you should have my screen. Yep, you're good to go. Okay, thanks. Uh, so hi, I'm Olivier Mobile. I'm Communication and Outreach Officer for UMEDSAT OSISAF. So I will be presenting some of our CIS products uh, on behalf of my colleagues from the consortium. For those of you who might not be familiar with the UMEDSAT ecosystem, uh, the OSISAF is the Ocean and CIS Satellite Application Facility. It's a consortium uh, dedicated to pro processing satellite data at the ocean atmosphere interface. It's led by Meteo France with a number of partnering institutes, uh, the French Research Center IFREMER and three other meteorological institutes, the Norwegian, Danish and Dutch meteorological institutes. Um, so together we process different sets of uh, parameters at the ocean atmosphere interface from meteorological satellites that uh, UMEDSAT operates. So we produce parameters for winds, for sea surface temperature, some sea ice parameters and radiative fluxes. Um, we produce these parameters uh, operationally, so in near real time, mainly for applications by other meteorological institutes that need them for near weather predictions, or also for the oceanographic community that needs new real-time data, but we also do climate reprocessings of, our, of some of our parameters. So today the focus is on sea ice parameters, so I'll speak a bit more about what we do about sea ice. So sea ice products um, are processed by uh, colleagues from Meteor from Met Norway, uh, from the Norwegian Meteorological Institutes and from the Danish Meteorological Institutes. They have their expertise at high latitudes and they process a different set of parameters uh, to track changes in sea ice. So it's sea ice concentration, sea ice edge. Uh, we also monitor sea ice drift, sea ice type, the emissivity of sea ice surface and also the temperature at ice surface. Lately, we've also started developing uh, climate indexes of uh, sea ice extent. So I'll, I'll focus on this because it, it's been what's been mostly picked up by the media and that synthesizes the information. So for these sea ice parameters, we process them with polar orbiting satellites and we have data at both poles. Uh, historically, when we use um, American military satellites, DMSP, and also UMEDSAT satellites to process our data. And there will be continuity with the next generation of UMEDSAT uh, METOP SG satellites that will allow us to have a continuity in all our parameters that we monitor. So um, here is a short overview of some of the products that we can have. So th that's a gallery. We can see here uh, different parameters at uh, a similar period. So we have ice surface temperature. We can monitor uh, concentrations. So here it's in the Arctic. Uh, and we have them, we have that both over uh, 
in, 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 a, in a polar view that covers all the Arctic or uh, all the Antarctic, and we can also have a regional zooms uh, for some of the parameters. So we also have emissivity with an example on Antarctica and sea ice type, which allows us to know if it's uh, first year ice or if it's multi-year ice or how it, it doesn't give directly the ice age, but it tells us if it's, it, if it's fresh ice or if it's open water or if it's older ice. We also monitor the drift to see uh, how, how ice shells are moving and how, how the, the, the general behavior and mechanical behavior of the of the sea ice and then uh, what I'm going to now focus on is also uh, another, another type of visualization is this historical time series of sea ice extent. So we use different colors to showcase uh, different uh, decades uh, of the annual cycle of Arctic sea ice extents. And this allows us to monitor if the current year or the current months is lower or higher than previous monitored years. So we now have 40 years of data covering sea ice concentration that allows us to do a global extent at, in the Arctic or in the Antarctic. And if we focus a bit more on this sea ice extent information, these are different visualization of the same information. So each month, uh, each, 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 each five days, we, 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 we recalculate the mean extent of sea ice and we compare that to previous years. So we can either compare it, uh, for instance, on the top left, we have a comparison to the mean of the, of the whole monitored period that we have. We have previous uh, lowest years on record, uh, 2020 and 2012, and we compare this with the current year that we have in black with the red that are the late, latest 15 days. And then we can see if the current year is lower uh, than previous year or, or is in agreement with the general mean that we have. This is a really good climate indicator that gives a synthetic uh, overview of uh, where we are at, both in the Arctic and in the Antarctic. So um, obviously the cycles are different in the Arctic and the Antarctic, given the different uh, seasonal, uh, this, the different seasonal cycles at both poles. But we have uh, we have a CI, we, we, one of the things we really monitor is the sea ice minimums. So it's 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 in September for the Arctic, and around the end of February for the Antarctic. So we can monitor either a comparison of all the years on the same curve just below, or we can also have uh, the annual cycle plotted continuously. Uh, that's what you have on, on the bottom left. So you have it uh, in the in the Arctic and the Antarctic, and this allows us to calculate a trend, uh, either a summer trend or a March trend given on the, so, so we do this monthly because uh, we have different trends, uh, whether it's the maximum or the minimum uh, month uh, for, the, for a given location. And another way of visualizing, visualizing this data is to do, is what you have on the right. Uh, it's inspired by the climate stripes that we all know for temperature, but we've adapted this to see how the specific month uh, ranks uh, in comparison of all the previous measurements. So um, if it's going to the red, it's that the sea ice extent for this given month and a given year is the lowest on record. So what we can see is that uh, all the latest measurements tend to go towards red so that we have uh, both in the Arctic and in Antarctic uh, globally lower uh, sea ice extent records, not, not necessarily the records uh, over the past year, but we tend to have uh, lower sea ice um, measurements every month. So this is a this has been used in, in several media applications and it, it's one of our most uh, distributed uh, visualization of sea ice extent. And you can have this, uh, all these plots, you can directly take them from the link that is on the presentation. You can directly find them and do, do, do screen copies of the, of, the, of the products there and you directly have the visualizations. So a few examples also on where else you can find our data. You, we have a website where you can connect to and register and we publish regular stories that show different visualization of our data. 
So I encourage you to register to the website or to have uh, to browse our website where you can find different uh, examples on how you can use our data. Um, another way uh, our data is used is uh, to redistribution to different European programs, mainly to Copernicus Climate Change Service and to Copernicus Marine Service. So here is an example of a European State of the Climate Report. Uh, it's a report that is annually produced by Copernicus Climate Change Service and that comes back to the climate status of the previous year. So the report for 2022 was published uh, early 2023 and uh, OSISAF data that is also uh, used as climate reference within the Copernicus Climate Change Service uh, is used to visualize the sea ice extent and uh, in the both in the Arctic and the Antarctic. So it's the same data that we were presented before with a different type of visualization. There's also maps of how the sea ice extent changes from one season to the other and you can have uh, regional uh, information from our data too. And so this gives you another example on how OSISAF data is used and you can actually find it also distributed not only from our website, but also through these Copernicus services. But it's in the end, this, the same data that comes from the OSISAF program. Um, what Fabrice mentioned earlier is actually a good example too. I used it here from the Copernicus Marine Service. Uh, it's actually a really convenient way to visualize data. You can also find the sea ice concentration data from OSISAF directly in the marine viewer from Copernicus Service. It's also served uh, and summarized by our experts um, that contribute to the white ocean of the ocean state report that Fabrice mentioned earlier. I really encourage you to go and see the different visualization that are produced there. Um, there's also case studies that we really that we work on together with UMITSAT, especially to to uh, provide indicators when it's the Antarctic sea ice minimum or the Arctic sea ice minimum. And we use uh, different visualizations that come from what I've presented earlier from sea ice extent, but it can also be sometimes we try to innovate and provide new visualization of our data. So it's also another great source of inspiration if you would like to have use cases of sea ice data. And one of the things I also wanted to mention is that uh, the, the sea ice extent that summarize uh, an indicator uh, of sea ice have also been picked up by different uh, journals. Uh, for instance, uh, French journal Le Monde has now a set of nine key indicators uh, to monitor the global climate, uh, out of which he, it, it shows a time series of Arctic sea ice and the status of Arctic sea ice. So, that they're continuously monitoring the trend and it's 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 daily uh, updated so you, you can find our data that's operationally served uh, also directly broadcasted to the general public so if you wanted to do the same plots yourselves you can also directly access our data or contact our help desk there's also and one of the things that is also interesting is that sometimes our data is misused so there has been um, an article by the French press agency that sometimes debunks uh, how data is used by climate septics. For instance, if you look at the trend here in May, uh, sometimes climate septics say that actually the trend uh, is should be going up or that there is no decrease in the Arctic. If, if the time series that of our, of our observation started in 87 and ended in 2022, then we could draw a line and then the trend would be different than the one that we claim to be uh, the loss of sea ice that we monitor since the early 80s. So you have to be really careful on how you use the data. Uh, in science, you really need to use the full time series and to calculate a trend on a, on a complete period. Otherwise you might miss part of the signal and your data can be used uh, in a misappropriate way. So I encourage you to also uh, look where the data comes from and how it's used to always question uh, the sources. And if you have a doubt, uh, contact some of the reference websites or contact us to help us, um, to help us out with the data, to help you out, sorry. 
Um, another way that you can keep informed is you can follow us uh, on Twitter. We have a Twitter account where we publish uh, regular updates about CIs, and we have some of our experts that are quite active that you can also follow. That these are Thomas Laverne and Signe Abwe that I uh, have mentioned here on the slides. So you should have the slides and be able to join and follow uh, the discussions online. So if you want to access our products, we have different distribution means that I've mentioned some redistribution to Copernicus Marine and Climate Change Services, but one of the best ways to stay informed about uh, what we produce is to register to our website. We also have FTP direct access or UMEDSAT uh, data store access. Uh, so de depending on what, what your needs are, we could guide you to the best uh, access to our data. You can actually, it's, it's sometimes a bit confusing because you can find it in different uh, stores, but we can help you out with the data. So we also have a set of notebooks to guide you to use the data. So if you need help with the first steps to explore, map or download our data, it gives you a first hint on how to use and process our data sets. So this is already for more advanced user, but you have the link here to the notebooks. And again, I encourage you to register to our website, uh, whether if you just want stories and regular news, or if you want more in-depth knowledge on how to use our data, we can guide you from there. And you might also subscribe to our regular newsletters to keep informed about our training activities. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Olivier. That was a really great summary of all the different ways we can look at sea ice from space. I think we'll have some more talks about sea ice as well in the coming weeks when we get to talk about climate. Um, for now, if anyone has any questions for Olivier, please do pop them in the Slido. Um, after our last talk of the first half with Ada, we will come back and get some answers from him for you. Thanks again, Olivier. Ada, are you there? Can you join us? Yes, I'm here. Wonderful. Okay. Hello. Hello everyone. Uh, so first, thank you for inviting me to, to be here today. I'm going to share, um, let me share this screen. Da, 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 da. I think it's there. My presentation is much more personal than the two ones, which were really packed with information. That's, uh, it was really great to listen to. Um, I'm, I'm mostly giving uh, my view on how I use social media, how do I bring ocean, oceanography to, uh, to social media uh, with my own expertise. Uh, so I will start by just uh, using myself. I'm a physical oceanographer. I work at the University of Liège in Belgium and I'm a, an expert in uh, ocean remote sensing. Mostly the, the core of what I do is uh, developing uh, techniques to interpolate data, as already Hayley mentioned in the uh, introductory talk. Uh, some of the data that are measured by satellite uh, are obscured by the presence of clouds and clouds are all Ada, sorry everywhere. to interrupt so you just we, a minute, we uh, can't see your slides. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Um, no problem. Okay. Maybe just try resharing uh, your screen. I will share again. Yeah, let me uh, stop. Stop sharing. It did work. Okay, I will share the entire screen. Maybe that works better. So, do you see my screen? Yes, now we do. That's perfect. Okay. Then do you you see the full screen now? See, it's loading. Yes, we do. Perfect. That's yeah, wonderful. Good. Okay. I'm sorry for interrupting. No, no, no. Good, good. <laughs> okay, so what I was saying that uh, we have clouds in, in, in remote sensing data, and what I do as the main job is to develop techniques to reinterpolate, interpolate uh, the missing data and infer what would be behind the clouds. And this is the example you can see in this uh, movie. Here, this is the temperature in the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, once I have this data with with no clouds, so with no missing data, then I can use them for studies about the variability of the ocean. And this uh, I mostly do in the short and long term time scales, also in small and large uh, uh, spatial scales. So I, I really do try to um, uh, apply this data into a full range of, of uh, studies. 
I do also teach. Uh, we have a master in oceanography uh, in the University of Liège, so I do a lot of teaching uh, in this in this frame. Uh, now, um, with all this, so I'm a researcher, uh, um, um, I have to say that when I came to sharing oceans, uh, ocean images in, in social media, I have to say that the ocean well, is beautiful and it's inspiring, inspiring. So it's an easy target, I would say. People like seeing ocean images. So that's, it's an easy uh, work, I would say. Uh, I'm sharing here two images to explain, but Haley already uh, introduced that uh, a little bit earlier. Uh, we can see um, ocean color images in which the ocean, well, we think of the ocean as blue, but there are many things uh, suspended in the ocean that change the color. And it can be blue, turquoise, green, brown. And there can be a, a lot of colors in there. And this is because of the uh, uh, components that are suspended. It can be plankton, algae, or sediments, things that are just in the water. But then the ocean currents will move this around and then create these swirling images, this is changing uh, gradients of, of color. And this is uh, the movement that makes these uh, structures appear. So we can observe the movement of the water by the changes in the, in the color. And also look at other uh, variables like this of its temperature. So uh, in this image here, the red colors will be warmer waters and the blue colors will be colder waters. So we can again see how the ocean currents are merging, mixing and changing the, um, these water masses around. And this is something we can do with uh, satellite data very, very easily. They are very um, uh, they observe at range, uh, large range of scales. And so sharing this kind of images uh, in social media, I would say that they tend to be appreciated by, by a lot of people. Uh, now, why did I join uh, social media, Twitter? So I, I joined Twitter in 2017. Uh, and the aim there was to give uh, visibility to parts of my work that were less visible. Okay? I'm a researcher. And so my TV is uh, uh, have some lines with uh, research papers and presentations that I do at conferences, etc. But I found myself in, in this moment, 2017, in a lot of work that I really didn't know how to um, how to put value to to, the, to, to it. I was coordinating a, a project was a cost action that um, made me organize a lot of uh, workshops seminars, training schools, a lot of things that, well, it, it did just online in my CV, but it was a lot of work behind. So I thought, well, maybe sharing this in social media will allow me to show that well, there's all this work behind and, and put some value on it. Also teaching activities, teaching that's one line in the CV, but it's a lot of preparation, a lot of uh, field work and, and a lot of, of activities that, well, it's, it's, uh, it's a lot of work. So that, that was the the um, the motivation for joining social media show all that goes behind uh, this, uh, just workshops or co conferences or teaching now um i also um started sharing of course my work on remote sensing data uh and uh, one thing that came to mind when we work with uh, satellite data is the synergy between between the different variables i have put in here uh, two images, chlorophyll concentration on the left and sea surface temperature on the, on the right. And the colors indicate the concentration of chlorophyll or the temperature of the, of the water. And you can see again this concentration of chlorophyll that changes uh, with space and then currents that swirl around and show this, um, this different um, movement of these particles. And you can see that as well uh, in another way in the temperature. So there is a lot of information about the ocean, about the movement of waters, about the, uh, the, the way the things change in which scales by looking at this satellite data. So I started uh, sharing as well my work, satellite data. This is Sentinel-3 data, by the way. And, and this is something that I do like every day. I work with this kind of data, try to infer things about the ocean, uh, studying the scales and, and the magnitudes of the, of the variables that uh, are measured. Um, now, I like having a little fun from here, here and there. Before you so go I also on, started. 
I just wanted to say maybe you can turn your camera off because your sound is quite interrupted. Okay. So maybe, yeah, maybe if you turn the camera off, maybe it's a bit clearer so we can hear you a little better. It's not too bad, but yeah. just so, yeah, you know, we want to hear you properly. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Okay. Are you still um, able to see my my screen full screen? I can see. Oh, it's loading. Yep. I think. Hang on. Yes, we're back now. Wonderful. Let's try again. Okay. Sorry about that. I don't know what happens. <laughs> um, so yeah. So I, in in addition to just show my work on the meetings, etc., I started having more fun and and started sharing things that I found interesting and uh, didn't know what to put them, more or less. So I, I find things, a lot of things interesting with ocean satellite data, lots of things out there that just, yeah, they they, they should be known by lots of people, they should be shared. And, and I found social media is the place in which have discussions of this data. I'm just putting those two, two examples in here, um, in which I just, one, one very recent here in the in the left, but sharing um, ocean phenomena that we can measure with a satellite. This uh, image in the left in the left shows you um, uh, internal waves across the uh, Gibraltar Strait, and uh, because two satellites, Sentinel One and Sentinel Three, measured the region on the same day, but with a few hours of difference, four hours of difference, we can see how the the wave displaced with, uh, with time. So we can measure the propagation of the waves. So I just, just I, I like doing this kind of little research. So um, just find the data, do some measurements and just put it on the, on the, on the web. This allows me to um, increase my knowledge about things. This is not something I work with in fact, internal waves is not my, my research aim, but this allows me to uh, share this, to, to find people interested in this, in this event and yeah, and have some. Fun. So I'm, I'm really, most of the aim, most of the time, this kind of images when I share them, it's just for fun. And another uh, example that I have put here in the, in the right image, this is just to show that I'm not taking myself seriously at all. Uh, there's something in the ocean that we call eddies, which is like uh, uh, things with uh, round circulation, circulation. So water will circulate around itself in, in circles. And sometimes you can see this red filament here. This is warm water. It will turn into itself, right? It's, this is an eddy turning uh, into itself. And I found that this one is specifically uh, formed like an E. And then I wrote the, the, the word E, using that E, uh, just to show the beautiful image. And I also have some fun about this. Yeah, I'm not taking myself seriously with when I share these, uh, these images. But this allows me to really get to more people and, and increase the, um, the network um, that, I, that I'm building in thanks to social media. Sometimes I'm just sharing uh, images because they are pretty. Um, I like it with colors. Uh, there, is, uh, there are blooms in the Baltic Sea. This is a, a natural color image in the right. Um, an ocean color bloom in which you can see this phytoplankton more in green and then the uh, blue waters. So when you download this data and visualize it, and well, I, I like just having fun and, and, and sharing this with, with people. This kind of uh, play around, I think that, that has a lot of uh, yeah, acceptation. So people appreciate that we're not just serious people, researchers are not always just, just making serious things. We can also have some fun, if I can say it. Uh, now, I was asked to, to share here what works and what doesn't work when we share uh, our work in, in social media. And of course, this depends on how you measure success. Uh, if you're just counting the amount of likes that you get when you share an image, uh, then I would say that beautiful images with something behind, with something they can explain about what is in, in, in this image. So this, where does this swirling come from? These uh, uh, colors that we see in the Adriatic. These are things that people like a lot and then they, you can really reach a lot of people and teach about what what is in the ocean, what happens in the ocean. Uh, but in fact, when I prepared this slide, I just looked in my Twitter account which images were more liked. And this one here came as well. So this is from my teaching activities. Uh, this just showed a prism and how the light from the sun 
is uh, decomposed into all the colors of the, of the light. And, and yeah, so teaching people simple things and, and showing them how things work, that's also something which is very, um, it's very nice to, to, to just share with, with everyone. So yeah, uh, all activities, all images can have, uh, can have an impact. Now, I don't really measure success with likes, um, as a researcher, I should measure them, the success with uh, new collaborations, new papers. And in fact, thanks to uh, sharing things in, in social media, I also have uh, papers and new collaborations that are coming out. Um, for example, in the left, this is a sea surface temperature image uh, of an eddy in the Mediterranean Sea, very large, very strong. And I was uh, sharing this uh, um, in social media saying, well, this is a large one. This is an important one, it's interesting. And then um, some colleagues from uh, Spain contacted me. They were also looking at this, uh, this uh, eddy. So we started collaborating on a paper. Um, so yeah, that, that was really a nice story to, to, um, to, to come about with, uh, with uh, sharing our knowledge in, uh, in the internet. And the similar story is behind the image in the right. This is another eddy in the Mediterranean as well, near the Alboran Sea. I started looking at it uh, and sharing images in, in Twitter um, in 2022, saying, well, this is a small eddy, but it's nice. There was a, a turtle with a GPS sensor on it. And I observed that the turtle was swelling, well, uh, swimming around the eddy. And um, well, it, that demonstrated that the eddy had some food in it. So there was some ecosystem implications to this presence of this eddy and that we could see with satellite data. Some people in the Institute uh, of Oceanography in Spain contacted me. They were about to sail with, to, to, this, uh, to this region for some uh, routinary campaign. So they said, well, we can measure the eddy. So they did additional measurements and then we collaborated on another paper. So just to say that, just sharing interest can give, can bring new uh, collaborations. And that's also, uh, I mean, that's, that's very interesting. Uh, another way of sharing is also through the uh, um, uh, development of use case, which is something I do with, uh, with UMEDSAT from time to time. Uh, also NASA sometimes uh, has uh, published some of the uh, things that I share um, in their in their web pages. So I mean, there's different ways uh, to um, to measure to to share what we can what we can do with our satellite data. Uh, so just to conclude, uh, this, this is really a, a very personal vision. Uh, so I share images, a uh, satellite image, with no aim at being uh, stunning or or perfect. I'm, I'm just trying to get the story through, trying to be informative. And in fact, the final aim uh, of me being in social media is to improve my, uh, my work network. That's, that's what, what brings me the most from this uh, sharing. Now, also, I would like to say that maybe we shouldn't put all our eggs in one basket. I have been working, I've been, I've been uh, posting in uh, Twitter for a long time. Now, if I'm not self trying to also um, go to Mastodon, but maybe one social media can change from one day to the next, and then we find that our community is no longer there, then we have lost all the community we built over the years. So maybe diversifying is something we should we should do as uh, as scientists uh, sharing our our work. So that's all I had to say. Um, I will stop uh, sharing. Um, let me see how to stop sharing. Stop sharing. Okay, so thank you. Thank you very much, Ada. I think that was a really good point to end the session on, or the hard first half of the session on. Um, we've got lots of questions coming through for you all, uh, but I really liked your point, Ada, about the, the beauty, the simplicity, and the humanity of sharing some of these stories, especially ones that aren't perfect. And I think for me, that's been some of the nicest conversations I've had with people have been around these kind of images that we throw out there. I mean, I think that's how you and I know each other and you and me and our colleague who's coming up in Vittorio actually end up talking about these kind of things this way all the time. And it's a really nice way of, um, people exploring and understanding data in different contexts through visualization. So thank you for sharing. Okay, let's take a little bit of a look at where we are with our Q&A section. And thank you to all my colleagues and the fellow panelists who have been 
um, answering some of the questions as we go. Um, we've had a lot of questions already, which is great. Some more specific than others, but I'll pick out a couple now for our panelists maybe to comment on. Um, I really liked this one at the top, which said, um, as a journalist, I know that a lay person will have a hard time coding such charts. Uh, is there simpler or well annotated ways uh, to make them? And uh, we will look a little bit at some in um, some practical hands on things with Ben towards the end of the session. Um, but I thought maybe the panelists could comment on some of the uh, most appropriate ways that uh, they have I mean, or highlight maybe some things from their talks um, that would be the key places to look. So maybe events or resources that you have. So. Uh, Fabrice, Olivier, Ada, anyone would like to comment on that question? Um, I, I think, I mean, Fabrice and, and Olivier would be maybe more better suited for that. But uh, I think that there has been an explosion of resources for uh, accessing the data in the last, uh, I would say, five years. There is a lot of material out there. Maybe you don't know it, but yeah, this this kind of of webinars may, may approach people to the experts that can show them and then I guess Fabrice and, and Olivier are yeah on, on the on the website uh, of the Copernicus Mind Service we try to share all uh, the, the the codes we are using for data visualization uh, and the majority is in Python with Jupyter notebooks we share also the data and uh, uh, for each um indicators we uh, we provide so um and yes and in june we will have this uh, a training workshop for journalists and we will try to uh, go further with them on they what they need to 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 play with this data do they need a new tool do they need uh, uh, to sharing uh, tutorial videos on how to create this uh, uh, this kind of uh, data uh, visualization. It's very important for us to understand uh, that they need to, un to answer. For, but for the moment, we share codes, we share data, uh, we share uh, on-the-shelf uh, indicators with maps and plots, etc. Uh, and, and viewer and tools to 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 create new maps. Olivier, would you like to add to that at all? I mean, I know OCSAF has a similar perspective. There's lots of stuff available to reuse. Yes, I think what also lays behind this question is it's sometimes difficult maybe to find your appropriate tool because there's a lot of them popping up. Mm. Um, I mean, we, we, we have the notebooks, as Fabrice said, that help you out to download and plot the data, but maybe that's already advanced. If, if you are not familiar to plot the data, we also have viewers and you can directly download figures and indicators. Copernicus Marine is namely working on, on producing indicators that you can download. We also have direct visualization on our website that you can directly download uh, as they are. But if that doesn't suit you, then of course you have to get your hands on the data and visualize it. But uh, I wouldn't add more than what Fabrice said. If you have specific needs, we are happy to hear about them and to see how we can facilitate your work and be creative with our data. Yeah, I was going to say, I think that would be how I would wrap up uh, an answer to this question. We just say, you know, we have this workshop in part so that we have this network of people. So for all of you out there who are listening, you, you know our names, you know our faces now, you know where we work. Most of the times you'll have our email addresses. You can contact us directly or our organizational help desks. Uh, really, most people I know, uh, certainly my experience is people who are expert in this data and these topics are very, very happy to work with people um, who are communicating to the public to help get the data out there and help people understand more about our, our oceans. So yeah, yeah, please do use the network you've built here. And don't, and don't be scared by, by codes because we try to provide ready to use codes and you work a lot and Ailey, Ben, you know exactly what I what I mean. Uh, uh, to, to make this code uh, replicable, you have just to change some of uh, some numbers to to change the figures and 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 uh, and get what you what you need. So uh, we have different level of uh, Jupyter notebooks for for beginners and for advanced people. So take a look. Thank you very much. I think that was maybe the most general question we had here, but what I might do is encourage uh, my fellow panelists here to have a look at some of these uh, more specific questions. Um, maybe you could answer them during the course of the next part of the session. 
um, so that we've got some answered. Um, I liked the question here about a chat GPT plugin. That was quite an interesting one. Um, yeah, if you're new to code, these sorts of tools are going to help you, I think, a lot to work more with um, the data and also with finding the resources that you need to. Um, a lot of them are working based upon the sorts of information that we put out there on the internet. So even if you're finding code via that medium, it's probably informed by a lot of things. But of course, um, be careful. It's a new and, um, new and growing technology. Um, I'm just trying to see now any particular questions that we have are relevant. They're jumping around a bit. We've got maybe time for one more. Um, Perhaps let's uh, go to, there was one that was asked of Ada, I think of on comparison of the temperature and chlorophyll. And I'd like to hear everybody's comments on this one. So um, are the same depths of all the column being measured? Does it matter? Now we have uh, an answer from Ben already in the chat, but um, my perspective on this would be no and maybe. <laughs> so, and I guess this goes for a lot of um, questions about how you intercompare ocean variables. So being cognizant that you're not necessarily comparing apples with apples, it's sometimes apples and pears, but sometimes it doesn't actually matter. Ada, maybe you want to speak about the eddy example uh, in this case, because I think that's a particularly compelling one. They always look really similar, even though they're not really the same. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, uh, yeah. I think with satellite data, we also we always have uh, to work with that. As you say, they are not exactly measuring the same, and they are not measuring the same in the same way. So, uh, I mean, you have to know the the, the limits of the of the um, technique. But depending on the scale in which you are working, uh, things will be pretty much uh, equivalent. So when i when i'm sharing images of uh, eddies and, and things like that as you said highly uh, we can see that they match more or less um you will get uh, roughly the relation low uh, temperature high chlorophyll so that will be the, the direct relation between them but then of course if you look exactly at in which position do we get uh, the lowest temperature in which position we get the highest chlorophyll, then then it becomes more complicated. Um, also, a temperature will only give you the specific, this exact surface of the water, really very, very surface. And ocean color, if the water is transparent, you will get more depth integrated value. So, yeah, it's complex. <laughs> it's not, it's not, uh, there's no direct uh, answer. Uh, so yes and maybe yes. <laughs> if, if I can very quickly add to that, because I commented in the thread, I will add my ambiguity of the answer to everyone else's ambiguity of the answer. The answer is sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah it's never never easy to know always what's um, being shown, and sometimes you have to look more in depth at the data to figure it out and look at it not just single images, looking at multiple images, looking at models to support. Very much depends on what. The question is that we're looking at so and this is where it's a really good time and i think ada showed this excellently with her presentation to connect with people on things like twitter um you have scientists kind of in the palm of your hand there if you ask them about this they'll talk about it for ages uh, we're all you know sort of passionate nerds so i think it's um it's a really good that people can uh, interact in that way around topics like visualization so okay i think we have to move on unfortunately to the next set of presentations but we will Endeavour to answer more of your questions online in the Slido, so do check back there for answers to your questions. And we'll also come back to more of them later on at the end if we have time to go through them. But thank you so much for all the questions. It's really great that people are so engaged uh, in the topics today. So first up in our session this afternoon then is Giovanni Coppini, who is going to talk to us about SAR data. Giovanni, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes. Do you see Wonderful. me? I do, and I see your screen as well. So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure and thank you for the invitation. I'm Giovanni Copini from the Euro Mediterranean Center on Climate Change in Italy. Uh, my presentation will focus uh, on uh, how to use satellite data and also ocean model to monitor and forecast the OSP. Let's see. Basically, the, the two components of my presentation will be the satellite capacity of uh, monitoring subtle, uh, monitoring oil spill and the Copernicus Marine Service as a ocean forecasting system to use to to forecast how the uh, the oil will move at sea so basically to let, let's introduce the problem i mean we are living more and more in an uncertainty 
uh, world where extreme events and accidents at sea will really uh, propose to us to tackle environmental crises, uh, which are very often uh, to be handled by uh, stakeholders and uh, professional and responders at sea. So, in the ocean, we face a major ice leak, and uh, we need to know how to fix them, how, to, how this oil will move. And uh, often, the situation is that the spill at sea is not under control, so it's uncontrolled. Uh, as an example, and I will show you more and more, uh, we had a major oil spill in, uh, for instance, in the Mediterranean Sea. This is the case, I will come back to it, uh, <clears throat> of a couple of years ago in the Syrian coast, but it was also um, affecting uh, Turkey and Cyprus. So, what uh, we have developed, uh, uh, I, I, it was in the first slide, this is a collaboration of CMCC, my institute, and Orbitaleos, is a Spanish uh, startup company expert in oil spill detection from satellite. So, what we have developed is a, a, a global, uh, uh, worldwide system to detect oil spill and forecast the oil spill. So, uh, we, uh, and this is the task of Orbitaleos, uh, we use uh, all the available, or most of the available data, as as much as possible, the Sentinel-1, but as well Sentinel-2, Landsat, uh, and then uh, uh, Cosmos SkyMed and uh, other satellites, including the commercial one. Because often uh, we need to uh, gather together different uh, uh, satellite uh, images to properly monitor the evolution, the detection and the evolution of a oil, oil spill. Here you see, uh, for instance, uh, uh, an optic image able to detect also in blue the light oil and in red the thick oil. So this is today an operational uh, uh, capability. Uh, so it's a satellite-based detection system uh, uh, where we can report, monitor and report the, the oil evolution. Uh, it is based on artificial intelligence, but also human intervention to, for the interpretation, but mostly is AI based, and uh, it's it can also be interfaced with uh, uh, AIS, so automatic identification system of ship to understand oh, we where the oil is coming from. In addition yeah. to that, uh, in products, the size there is a bit of a region noise. In addition to that, we have developed an automatic system that, uh, uh, using Copernicus Marine Forecast and Medlic 2 oil spill model, is able to forecast, uh, starting from the satellite detection as initial condition, is able to forecast the evolution in time for the next uh, few days uh, of the oil. Of course, we reinitialize the, the, we validate and reinitialize the oil spill simulation as soon as we get the new, uh, the new observation from satellite. Let me see if I can go on. Yep. So, just to uh, let you understand uh, the multimodal approach, uh, when we, after we detect the oil spill, then we are able to forecast the evolution in time uh, all over the world using two global models, mainly the Copernicus Marine Service, but also the CMCC uh, Global Ocean Model. Uh, and as well, we have uh, exploited all the, uh, apart the Arctic model, all the other regional seas uh, uh, model from Copernicus, so from uh, Mediterranean, Black Sea, uh, Northwest Shelf, and uh, Baltic and DB. Uh, so increasing the resolution where it is available, as well as uh, the CMCC coastal models. Here you see at the end an example of a very high resolution model for the Dubai area. So in principle, where needed that we can develop a high resolution forecasting system to to increase the accuracy of the model of the solution a, a very nice example of what, how we validate in this case the modeling component here you see a drifter launch at a certain time and the oil spill model forecasting the oil spill evolution in time it was a big exercise of uh, this month in may uh, in, in Italy, uh, where they simulated uh, and uh, they exercise how to respond to the oil spill, including the usage of a uh, uh, oil spill trajectory model. 
So uh, as a summary, basically, we have a noise spill capacity, uh, surveillance capacity uh, that uh, is integrated with the oil spill forecasting worldwide. And then we can report uh, the information to the users. Uh, uh, then, uh, uh, in our mind, the reduction, uh, reducing the volume uh, of oil that will affect the coastal areas uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, re reducing the environmental impacts. So, some very uh, briefly, some use cases. This is, for instance, the capacity of satellite monitoring uh, uh, and then uh, uh, interface, interface inter uh, uh, put together with the IES detection system. And here you see that uh, most probably we can identify the ship that has deliberated the polluted the ocean. Uh, we can uh, monitor assets. In this case, uh, is an uh, 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 oil platform that uh, has produced some slick and some spill. And then uh, this is uh, also a very important uh, use case. And uh, here, the, the big example of the Syrian, uh, where uh, uh, thousands of, of oil were spilled at sea, and it is uh, a, an immense uh, amount of uh, images that we got over a month, so I think more than uh, 30 images were collected. Uh, and it was also a real case, meaning that uh, we have been asked uh, by REMPEC, uh, which is the Regional uh, Emergency Marine Pollution Center uh, in the Mediterranean Sea. So we have collaborated with them and consequently with the Syrian, Turkish, Cyprus uh, uh, authority to provide them information on where the oil was and where the oil was going to go. Uh, here you see all the information that was provided uh, uh, to REMPEC in, in real time. Another capacity that is in addition, let's say, to the satellite monitoring is that we can run simulation, uh, and this is uh, uh, available, uh, we can run simulation uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, let's say, scenarios of oil spill in the ocean supporting, especially these are used in case of accident, uh, uh, to support the authority. And again, this use uh, Copernicus Marine Service uh, as uh, ocean forecasting and the CNWF as wind forecasting. So I think this is, a, uh, to, to conclude, this is a very advanced system for monitoring and reporting the oil spill. It's a team of uh, large uh, experience uh, and uh, is on the market. So it's also, I think, a very nice use, uh, uh, case of uh, including commercial exploitation, uh, but based on science and research results and exploiting Sentinel uh, and all the satellite and Copernicus Marine Service, uh, trying to improve uh, the, also the accuracy. So the two partners are Orbitale OS, this uh, uh, Spanish company, and uh, uh, CMCC. Uh, just to conclude, uh, I, I would like also to mention that all these activities are also included in the, the Ocean Decade Action, uh, which is called Predict on Time, that will, uh, is a project that, that will redesign the way we are doing um, coastal observation and forecasting, including the support uh, to oil spill monitoring and forecasting. Here you see the context. Thank you. Thanks very much, Giovanni. That's a really compelling use case. I mean, I think it's amazing how you can see so much about these oil spills from space, but also how directly relevant it can be to addressing this problem in society as well. So thank you very much for sharing those examples. Uh, any questions for Giovanni, please put into the Slido and we'll come to them at the end. Uh, next up, we have Vittorio Brando, who is also joining us nicely to talk about turbidity, different topic entirely. <laughs> So, good morning. Uh, good morning by now, it's afternoon, I would say. Good, mo good afternoon, everyone. Let me find the sharing thing. So, I'll share the screen with you. And I think I want to share this screen here. Share. So, you see my full screen? We do, yes. Thanks, Victoria. Okay. So, again, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks. Um, everyone for organizing this uh, meeting and for the speakers before before the meet to just making some very interesting points and points i'm gonna i'm gonna save me some time and help me to make some take some points across 
I'm Vittorio Brando, based at the National Research Council of Italy, Institute of Marine, Marine, uh, Institute of Marine Research in Rome. And uh, in one of my day jobs, I am the leader of the Ocean Color Thematic Assembly Center for, um, uh, for, the, for the Copernicus Marine Service. In another of my day jobs, I am interested in uh, uh, looking in at uh, fine scale oceanography in uh, coastal and uh, coastal and inland and lagoon waters. So I'm sh I will show a, a bit or a bit of both. Um, uh, so the um, maybe. So um, initially I was meant to be talking to you about the example of Venice uh, and the impact of the media. And that's going to be the first half of or more than half of my presentation. And that I'm going to mainly be showing some slides that were presented by Federica Braga last year at the Ocean from Space Conference, presenting the paper we wrote during the COVID lockdown on the impact of COVID lockdown on the transparency in Venice Lagoon using the sentient imagery. And I'm probably am trying to do reflect a bit about the impact on the media and social media. Then, because we never stop, and looks like I'm chasing, um, I'm chasing ambulances. Uh, I'm going to show some of the effect of the uh, the, um, the water flooding of uh, last couple of weeks in in northern Italy, and how uh, what are what were effect is it its effect on the northern Atlantic Sea river plumes. Um, so uh, moving again, you're going to see a first of these slides with the red signs, and uh, I left clearly the the layout of the of those slides to to really. Uh, to really show where the where this material comes from, these are some slides presented as a, as I mentioned in the conference, and it's a summary of the paper we wrote during the lockdown itself. Um, um, the uh, just a brief introduction. I don't need to remind you what the lockdown was for every one of us in Venice, uh, Venice, uh, Venice, and Venice area. The the first COVID cases were confirmed when Italy when Venice was in the middle of a carnival. So in Venice that weekend there were hundred thousand people floating around having a lot of fun. In the in the following two weeks all the regional all the lockdowns started to be put in place, and from 10th of March everyone was locked down. Venice went to lockdown earlier because it was one of the regions where the cases were popping up then. The tourism stopped, and so everything changed in the economy of Venice, for the, uh, and, the, and also the number of people up, uh, going to Venice clearly for the, for the next uh, for the next few months. Um, because of the isolation and the reduction of tourist tourism and the reduction of water traffic, the water uh, the water changed. The mainly there was an increase in visibility, and a lot of pictures started circulating to the social through the social media. And that meant that the uh, there were um, the, the there were international news outlets showing how clear the water was, and this was the most same moment where you would see that in Beijing there was no traffic, that in uh, and everyone else there was all there were that uh, were all the all these videos. I went look them yesterday. They, they start from Venice and then will take you to Beijing, to to Paris, to to Washington or whatever else to show everyone we were at a standstill. Important point to make is that. Is that in those weeks we, we we were engaged by the our colleagues at the Copernicus Marine Service in uh, in Toulouse and uh, Fabrice was one of the person working there asking us okay what can you tell us using satellite imagery on what's going on can we see something and so this is one of the images that we found and and it was tweeted by the Copernicus uh, Central uh, Central Twitter Central Twitter account. On sh was when the first images were found on the fact that all everything around Venice was stopped. So from that moment onwards, we started with Federica to start working and doing scientific analysis to understand what was going on. These are some of the methods. And the point to make is that this is all the analysis that was done by using the true colors and the turbidity maps of the of the sentient to data at 10 meter resolution and using calibrated turbidity maps that I will show later on. The, um, so what we can do really, and that's what we've been doing for hours, and what I'm saying for hours means that most of March and April, we spent it in from, from all the six from motor from six different houses playing spot differences. So we're trying to figure out and use the imagery to describe what the system is like, was like, what was happening. 
And uh, so uh, there are a lot of a lot of issues that we will see. And this is a particular example. This is the last day before uh, the rest any restrictions were in place. And this white stripe is the are all the water taxis and water boats uh, connecting the airport to Murano and to Venice. And so these are all of them, all those bit speed boats at high speed doing the, uh, raising, raising the boat wakes. Obviously, if you stop it, if you stop traffic, there is nothing there to see. And then if we go to the, the mainland, to the, the central part of Venice, uh, here, here, here where we are, this one is a normal day of traffic as it is now, or, or it would be any, any day where there is a lot of traffic, you see some larger boats speeding more or less and the smaller ones and the water buses and whatnot. While on 19 of March, there is only one boat visible, perhaps two. So there is a big change in who was allowed to, even who was allowed to go there. Mainly the only traffic allowed by then was emergency and food delivery and a little bit of logistics, really nothing. more. Um, so we can continue to go spot differences in other regions and we can go and look towards the airport itself and the, uh, the, um, the canal where the boats go, uh, go back and forth from the city to the, to the airport. And in here we can see how the water clarity changed and, to, and this is an, for us was an interesting, was an interesting uh, finding. The, um, the, the Darsana, so the, uh, the marina of the airport, is a place where there, are a lot of, there is a lot of traffic going in and out. So this play, in, this, in, uh, in this marina, the, the water never has a chance, for, the sediments in the water never have a chance to, set, to settle. So there is everything, every time so the water is, gets suspended. After a week of, the, of, the, of, no, of no traffic at all coming, out of, coming in and out of the airport, you can see that you can see that really the water gets clearer, and you can see all the canal here. And the same is uh, similarly on the on the, uh, the smaller portion of this uh, of this channel co connecting the city and the, and the airport. So um, another example was to show to compare the Easter weekend across the two uh, across the two across the two years, the year before where we are in peak, where we are in in peak tourist influx season to with the uh, with the 10th of april where we are and really nothing is happening uh, another example of what we could see is the around the, the 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 port the port of venice and this is where the tourist port is and you can count and see how many cruise ships there were uh, there were in 19 and obviously there were no cruise ships in 2020 and all the associated traffic that goes with it um, we now go to the interesting part from a scientist perspective, which is the uh, how much the um, what is the suspended sed sediment patterns and what we could uh, describe in, from the sediment patterns for, for our analysis. And in here we could see that the uh, as the boat traffic almost stopped, the turbidity and uh, in the channel and the airport were really low and comparable to what we saw in the in in the in the normal life images only around now we now we see it also in the in the channel itself so um go just because i'm mindful of my time uh, these are uh, this is another example for instance of uh, obviously it uh, uh, a turbid pattern it was is not only driven by uh, is not only driven by uh, driven by the uh, by the human traffic in this case so there is a, an example of the 19th of uh, uh, of the 19th of March, where the wind, the wind, there was a wind, a wind-driven resuspension. So that one, that one continued to happen, anyways. Let's be clear. Uh, so the question which were, that everyone was asking during lockdown is: is is this gonna is gonna last? This is obviously this was was a moment in time and in history where the the conditions were such that the uh, the. Um, uh, the water had a chance to to be to be clearer, but comes uh, July or September, we were back in in business with the usual uh, um, pre-lockdown uh, conditions. So, to to close this first part of the, the the description of this scientific paper, which is analysis based on the base of the, on visualization starts. As a, visual, as a visualization, and we we made more points, which obviously I did summarize. I didn't go through in this moment. The link to the paper should be sent to you, I guess, now by one of the colleagues. 
And uh, um, as we were saying, in most of the uh, most of the lockdown for all, most of the city was a reduction to uh, or the reduction in improvement to air quality, uh, noise, and reduction of, of vehicular traffic. For, for in Venice, was an increase in, in water transparency, and sentinel two imagery was uh, more than adequate, uh, useful to be able to use because of the temporal and, and spatial and radiometric resolutions to analyze the data. Now, from what is the impact on the media? This is a, this is this is something I thought I would share. Is this is once the paper got published and was already was still in no May 2020, it was it's been picked up by the by the scientific literature because it was one of the first one to come out. But it was also picked up when we when we presented to Twitter was picked up by by social media. So it had a lot of in, a lot of interactions in uh, and and continue sometimes you know there, there is a quid there is also up to up to one year later or sometimes someone tweets it i don't even know what, what language it is so i don't know what to say um so having closed this first portion i want to move to a second to a second to the more recent images that i was mentioning earlier um, in this case, I will change completely the way in the visualization I'm showing up to now. The, those images were uh, downloaded from these from the from the from these uh, data and were visualized in uh, were processed and then visualized in QGIS to prepare for a scientific publication. In this case, instead, last week because of the um, the, the large floods in the Emilia Romagna of mid-May, we were curious to see what uh, what was the effect of, some of those small rivers finally getting to the Atlantic Sea, and so we started to look at these images with the idea of to document it for tweeting it. So it was really about visualization. So what we did is I asked my colleagues that within the Ocean Color Thematic Assembly Center of the Marine Service uh, take care of the Sentinel-2 production to give me the uh, look at some of the images that were there. And um, so let me spend a minute on what we have currently in the catalog. In the current in the catalog currently, there is a, a production of uh, the several products based on Sentinel-2 that are a merge of Sentinel-2 A and B at 100 meter resolution. The imagery available on the um, on the on the Copernicus Marine Service data portal are available from the 1st of January 2020 onward either the level 3 daily or the level 4 daily gap field. And we serve the remote sensing reflectances that can be used to do, uh, to do through colors and uh, the suspended particular matter both at concentration and turbidity and the chlorophyll concentration. In this instance, given that I need to, to show you an image of the Adriatic Sea, I'm using the, uh, some images from this product of the Mediterranean Sea level 3 daily observations. So these are this is the image uh, these are the these are the images for, from the tweet that I think I tweeted it, I don't know Monday Tuesday last week and these are the images that were set put together using snap so using uh, using image processing to 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 make them as nice as possible where uh, and um, and so we the tweet is about is two couple is the two couples of images the true color where you can see you can see the how the plumes are evolving and uh, that the plumes are evolving and then the, the, the concentration of the turbidity itself on the first image going back to try and look what the what the what the process is and this is a point that that uh, fabrice made very clearly and aida made made even more importantly you're trying to make a story you're trying to have you need to have a striking visual so that then it, picks, it gets picked up and it makes sense on the on the 15th of May, you can see all the single rivers having a small, having a very small, uh, closed, uh, close to shore uh, plume, and that was because the in the previous week there was a lot of inshore winds which that kept the the river from flowing, and that's the river, and the reason why there was a lot all all the flooding inland, not so much because of the really big amount of water. In 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 a week, it it rained the the, the amount of four to six months. For the region so really we are way beyond uh, um, climatology but also because of this effect of the water not being able to to get into the ocean one week later the following cloud free image you see that then the wind has changed and so the the, the older all the various uh, plumes are able to then find their way so the water started uh, leaving the uh, leaving the um, uh, the flood plain to get to, to get into the ocean 
And again, this is a this is something I tweeted, and as I uh, as Aida was saying, some of the tweets when a tweet is topical and when a tweet is um, the image is striking, it gets picked up. This one is after a week. This is well, it's it's is it's, it's probably one of my uh, most uh, most looked at tweets in my, in in, uh, in terms of statistics and engagement and everything else. Um, but then we go back. Okay, but that was more than a week ago. How did the plume evolve even further? As I said, these are this data is um, is is in the Copernicus Marine Service uh, portals. So uh, what we can have a look at the uh, editorability field by just clicking at this at this uh, at this uh, vignette of the image on the on the product description page, and so that's what I did. And so now. The same image we saw before uh, is now in a different color scale. I use I use my Ocean Pro to select the dates, select my select a select a palette that I like, a range that I like. Now I'm going from 50 uh, to a video of 50 instead of the video of 30 in the previous image, and I can see again the same uh, the same feature. This is the same image as before, 15 of May. So we're seeing exactly the same uh, the same plumes um, that are kept to shore where that's where the highest concentration you see but you start seeing that there is still there is already something that some of the tracer that is going in in the in the coast in the coastal and uh, and towards the central of the of the Adriatic Sea following week following uh, and let's remind remind ourselves the sentinel 2 pass every 5 days and uh, uh, either A or B, but in some areas of the world, and the North Adriatic Sea is one of them, we have an image every two to three days. So we are able to really show, follow the patterns as they go. This is the image that we've seen already before, and you see that now the, the plumes are able to go and the concentrations also, the autorbit is becoming, is increasing offshore in all of the regions. Then, then, and this is a new image that you, you, is not been tweeted, so it's uh, it's it's new. To, uh, just I I made yesterday to look. The wind changed again, so now the wind pattern again is pushing the the is is pushing the waters uh, towards the coast. It's also true that it's not been as raining as it stopped raining, so there is also less water coming from uh, coming from the rivers, and you see how it goes. The story is not finished because then 20th of, May, 20th of May on Sunday it's cloudy. We don't see that much. Let's uh, to remind ourselves that cloud don't help us in uh, in being able to um, to look at to look at all of those uh, all this effect if we depend on um, on visible imagery. So in summary, the uh, I've shown two different visualization approach for water turbidity for two different aim. One was to start with from a visualization to write a scientific paper and to communicate it but it started from visualization so we found the issue and then we start we're trying to make a pro to describe the process in that case the data was the the level two data was downloaded from the ESA portal was radiometrically calibrated and atmospheric corrected corrected with acolyte acolyte itself was also used to retrieve the turbidity and then all maps were produced in, Q, in QGIS to be able to, to make them as uh, as consistent as possible so that they could be used for uh, for scientific uh, publication. In the second example I've shown instead, this was about trying to inform the community and trying to put something interesting and trying to relate what we see on our product and also trying to showcase that uh, what we do have in the Ocean Core catalog in CMEMS that may be useful for our applications. In this case, the true color images and to be the products were, uh, were 100 meter resolutions, which is what we serve for a series of reasons, mainly due to data volume, but were more than enough for, um, for the need of this kind of communication. And with this one, I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Vittorio. I really love that thank example. You I think it, uh, oh, <laughs> there you go, you're back. <laughs> I think that Venice example shows more than any I've seen in recent times, just how much Earth observation always has some kind of perspective to offer on what's going on in the world. And um, I think it's for water quality, this is a particularly interesting one because quite often we can see stuff that's happening in terms of these spills or changes in the environment using things like Sentinel-2 quite quickly and quite easily because the data is uh, so readily available and accessible now. But I also liked that you showed that to really understand are these differences I'm seeing 
real and why you have to look at multiple images and understand a little bit about how the system itself works. So it was a really fantastic example. Thank you. If anyone has any questions for Vittorio about uh, that work, please pop them in the Slido. And um, with that, we will move on to our final presentation before our last bit of Q&A. And that is Ben. Ben, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me OK? I can. Yes, thank you. Just going to share my presentation. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the final session of our Oceans and Sea Ice Week. In this session, we're going to be looking at some practical examples, tools and approaches for visualizing Copernicus ocean data. Uh, as a short introduction, my name is Ben Loveday. I am contracted to UMETSAT, where I run their Copernicus Marine Training Service, and I'm also a marine earth observation scientist, which means if you are going to apply to be involved in any of our training events, then chances are we'll cross paths. Or if you have any questions for me about how to use Sentinel-3 and Sentinel-6 marine data, I'd be happy to, uh, to field them. Uh, contact details for me will be given at the end of this presentation, along with links to further resources. We've got quite a lot to cover, so this is going to be quite a um, quick run-through tour of four different tools that I think would be useful useful for you when visualizing marine data and the reasons and situations in which you would choose to use them. So there's going to be four parts to this presentation. There'll be part one, how to quick view and share ocean variables. And we're going to look at a tool called UMETVIEW. Uh, you'll look on the right hand side of this slide and you'll see that there are little traffic lights telling you that this is a no code part of this presentation. We'll move on to part two, how to contextualize WMS layers. I'll explain what they are later with a software package called QGIS. Part three is how we go into more refined image processing with a software package called Snap. Uh, both of those, parts two and parts three, have optional code um, comp components to them. And part four is how we visualize or customize visualizations with uh, Python, and this is all code. Now, I'm going to divide these into roughly two separate um, sort of sections. Section one, part one and part two, we'll be dealing with uh, data or information that I'm going to call maps or layers. And part three and part four, we're going to be dealing with products and data themselves rather than pictures of data, the actual data. So I'm going to kind of refer to those throughout. So part one, quick viewing and sharing ocean variables with UMETVIEW. Now, UMETVIEW is a web portal that UMETSAT operates, and you can find it at www, oh, sorry, at uh, view.umetsat.int. And it's very good for allowing you to quick view RGBs to show some um, level two geophysical variables, as Haley referred to earlier, uh, both, um, for example, for chlorophyll and for sea surface temperature. You can make images and animations, and you can create and share these views. And if you look at the three links that are provided here, they actually will open up all of those three pictures on the uh, right hand side. And I've made them all public so you can um, so you can choose to uh, view and uh, explore them as you so see fit. Here is an example of how you met view looks. I have just gone to view.umetsat.int. You will see at the top bar that I'm logged in as me. If you try to log in and you don't have an account, you can apply for an Earth Observation Portal account. And then basically, once you're at this screen, you have a choice. You will be presented with a default view. And you can choose then to use this green button to add layers of any UMETSAT products, both um, from our mandatory programs or from the Copernicus series of missions to look at ocean variables uh, that are of interest to you. For example, if you look under Sentinel 3 A and B, we have uh, the Ulchi Ocean Land and Color Instrument, uh, Level 2 Chlorophyll products, as well as the Sea Surface Temperature products from the SLSTR instrument. And you'll free, feel free to uh, browse through and see what examples you can find. If you click on a layer, you add a layer here, then that layer will appear in your window. You're free to zoom in and zoom out. Here is an example I put together of the North Sea, and we can see lots of interesting bloom patterns that are occurring uh, throughout the region. Uh, this is the level two uh, chlorophyll product showing this, but we can also choose to, and here I've added multiple layers. If I click on the little eye and close the other one, we can see the sea surface temperature for this region as well. And if I wanted to, I can also turn on the level one RGB and show what the uh, what the top of atmosphere radiance would have looked like. So our our non uh, atmospherically corrected um, product. Now the nice thing with um, UMETVIEW is you can export all these images as well. You can um, add in other base map information. So do you want to see if I go back to my chlorophyll? Do you want to see for example, a different kind of earth background. Do you want to change your projection? Do you want to see any overlays for coastlines, boundaries, etc.? You can customize all of these and you can export all of this with um, as both a individual image of a scene and you can actually animate it as well. If you uh, if you interface with the time bar on the bottom, you can set the parameters for this. 
One of the nice parts about you met view is you can also share all of this information. Up here, I've got a name for my view, which is called North Sea. But if I just click on my views at the top here, then you will see I have lots of examples of different views that I have created over time. For example, for the A68A iceberg, for the Alborangia, for um, various oceanographic phenomena around the uh, southern um, tip of Africa and the Agullus currents and upwelling systems. And all of these are freely shareable with other people. When you share the view via the little via the URL, and you can get the URL by clicking on this little share icon here, then the other people can actually manipulate the view as well and share it back to you if they so see fit. So it's a nice, quite a nice way of collaborating around this data um, or around these these layers, these these um, images. Um, and you, it's a very quick way of doing some detective work to go and quite quickly find out, is there anything interesting happening in my oceanographic region of interest? Um, and then exporting quick and quite nice quality um, imagery to, um, to be able to distribute um, uh, to colleagues or on social media or uh, in support of um, applications that you're developing. So it's quite a nice uh, quick way of doing some analytical investigation into what might be happening in the ocean uh, for a given phenomenon. Now, one other thing I want to move, touch on before we move on to the second part is under each of these layers, if you click on this little eye, then it will open product information. And down here, you have a little thing under WMS access. Now, WMS stands for Web Map Service. So this is just a map or an image, but what the magic happens with this get capabilities document uh, link. So if I click on this, it will open a horrible looking text file that you don't need to know anything about. All you need to do is remember this URL and you can copy this URL and use it for later. Now this get capabilities is very important. And uh, most of these web map services like you met you, and let me show you another example from the Copernicus uh, Marine Service, My Ocean Pro. Uh, portal that Fabrice referred to before. If you open up any layer and you click on the I and you click on data access, then you'll have a link to WMS and I'll copy this link and it will give me the same get capabilities document. So this is really important when we want to use these WMS images or layers in external services, which moves me on to the second part of my presentation. So let's move on a little bit to part two. So part two is contextualizing these WMS, these web map service layers with QGIS. Now QGIS is an external software package. It's uh, community developed and open source, and it's available at the link I provide on the screen. And the nice thing about QGIS is it allows you to import any of these WMS image layers from any of these portals and contextualize them with other external information. You can also do quite a lot with regards to customizing projections and it offers some um, diagnostic capability as well. I'm not going to go into that too much here. I'm just going to show you how to visualize data. So I have already created a QGIS project, which is uh, shown on my screen now. And in this project, all I've done is I've started with a base map, which is just from a, just a dark gray base map provided by Esri. And I've piped in a load of data from different web map services from UMetView. And I've contextualized it with a load of other available WMS data that might be relevant to individual data sources from various other data providers. So to give you an example, in my project on the left-hand side, I have added the SLSTR sea surface temperature composite data from two days ago. And how did I do this? Once you open up a QGIS project, if you click on layer and add layer, and you go to this add WMS layer, uh, part, uh, menu item. If you click on this box, it will open up another box and all you have to do is create a new layer. So apologies, this is quite dark. And that URL I showed you from the get capabilities, all you have to do is paste it in this box. Hit OK and that is it. So once you've, um, uh, sorry, uh, hit OK. And then once this is available and you have to give it a name to save it, you connect this layer. So let me show you as my one. So I've got SLSTR. If I connect this layer, this will show me all the available layers that are inside this package. I can click one, click on add, and then that will magically appear as available in my project. So all you need is that one URL. And once you have that URL, you can pipe in any WMS layer that you want. So for example, here is the, as I said, the sea surface temperature composite from um, Sentinel-3 SLSTR. What do we want to contextualize this with? Maybe we want to cross-reference this, for example, given the current prevalence of marine heat waves. Um, the coral reef map provided by WCMC. So you can now see in this blue overlay I've provided the map of all the known coral reefs for a given area. And we can start to look at maybe some of the sea surface temperature signals that might be occurring around this. Just one example. 
As a second example, we can look at the level one RGB data, top of atmosphere RGB data provided by the Sentinel-3 Ulchi sensor. And we can see here, there's an example of a really big storm coming through in the, um, in the Western Pacific. And maybe we want to cross-reference that with the uh, GLOFAS flooding product uh, that tells us the 100-year return rate of floods in the region to see maybe there's potential for some of these areas to be impacted by, uh, by this impending storm. So this maybe gives us an idea of some of the data we might want to look at around these areas to look at what the, uh, what the ramifications are, both for coastal communities and for the environment. And as a last example, I've just added the Ulchi Level 2 chlorophyll composite. Let me just zoom out a little bit and I'm going to focus on Europe now. And I'm looking at the biological kind of component of the ocean. And one thing I might want to consider when I'm looking at this is maybe it's really interesting for me to look at what the coverage is of the uh, one example here of European uh, marine protected areas. So I've just added some polygons that show the MPAs for the um, for the. Uh, Western Mediterranean, and it takes a little bit of time for them to refine in terms of their resolution, but eventually they'll pop in and they'll be quite nice high res. And then we can start to look at, say, maybe there are um, indications in some places of uh, harmful algal blooms happening or some interesting biological features that might have implications or ramifications for our MPAs. So that's as far as I'm going to go with QGIS. It, in actual fact, it can do significantly more than this. I am not a QGIS expert, but QGIS I find to be a really useful tool for constructing visualizations where you want to take EO data, but also contextualize it with other information available from other sources about um, interesting kind of spatial coverage uh, variables, such as the three examples I've shown here. So, so far we have only looked at layers or maps of data. We have not at all looked at the data itself. We've only looked at someone else's kind of rendition of it. They've already created an image of it. If we want to look, begin to look at the data itself, it's where we start to get a bit more advanced, but that also at the same time puts a lot more power in our hands in terms of how we manipulate the data for our own purposes. The first tool I would recommend we look at is a software package called Snap. Now that is available at the link provided. Uh, Snap is an extremely powerful way of working with satellite data and net CDF data in general. It can work with the level one RGB data from the top of atmosphere to create true natural or false color images. We can actually use it to, pr to process our data if we want to perform some atmospheric correction. So we want to get rid of the effect of the atmosphere, which over the ocean can be responsible for up to 90% of our signal and really gets in our way if we're trying to visualize ocean variables. And we can also open geophysical variables like chlorophyll, like sea surface temperature uh, in the software package and work with level two data uh, and level three and level four data. If you're working with information from the Copernicus Marine Service and you just want a nice way of manipulating net CDFs, then SNAP is actually a very powerful way to do this. So let's take a quick look at SNAP now. So this is uh, what SNAP looks like when you open it up. You'll have three major panels. Um, in the left hand side, you have a top panel that decide that tells you all the products you have open on the bottom panel. You have uh, one of a number of options telling you uh, about your map coverage and giving you an overview of your product. And in the main panel, you have an exa your example imagery of the area that you're looking at. Now, I want to do, touch on something here. So I'm working with a Sentinel-3 Level 1 uh, top of atmosphere um, full resolution product. And what I've done is I've created a quick RGB by opening this product and to open a product, the best way to do this, once you've downloaded one, I'm don't, afraid I don't have time to go into that here, choose any product you want. And when you open it, you want to open it clicking on this manifest file, which opens the product in its entirety, not just a single band. So that's what I've done. I've done that five times here for, for various different products. And once I've opened the product, if it's, a, if it's an Ultra product, I can choose this open RGB image window and this will give me a recipe, what it recommends for how I create RGB from all the various channels that are available inside an Ulchi product. Now, Ulchi has 21 radiance bands. Um, those bands are all really very narrow, making them extremely useful for quantitative ocean color work in the ocean. So we ideally want to use these bands to construct a picture that looks relatively familiar to our eyes. But our eyes are actually relatively wide in terms of the red, green, and blue bands that they see over. So we have lots of ways of combining Ulchi data to try and produce a facsimile of what our vision would, would tell us was an acceptable picture and what we would actually see if we were looking from space with our own, uh, with our own eyes. 
Now, there's a recipe here called try stimulus, uh, which is the one that defaults to. Try stimulus is designed specifically to try and map satellite Earth observation data to what our eyes would expect. And this is the image that I have um, constructed here using the try stimulus uh, recipe. And this gives us kind of a view of the North Sea, of the northern UK, and we can sort of see some interesting things happening off the coast with regards to maybe some turbid waters and some hints of some blooms that are, uh, or some biological activity that may be occurring in the area. However, there is way more than just one way to construct, to put the bands of Alchi together to construct a picture that's useful for us. And so when we use terms like true nat uh, natural color, they're really quite loose. So I encourage you to be a little bit um, adventurous in terms of how you combine bands to show that what you are uh, what you are interested in, provided you you provide the recipe or declare what you're using when you when you publish your image, then uh, then there's no problem for you to use the bands for whatever purpose as you see fit. So for example, this is a tri stimulus image. This is a different band recipe RGB image, which already I think is slightly better, we can see more of the biological activity. This is yet another example. Let me just wait for that to load in, which shows maybe even slightly better again. Um, uh, some of the turbidity around the Thames estuary, around the east coast of Kent in the North Sea, and maybe a little bit sort of like towards the Atlantic area just out here. But we can see this area is still really, really very blue. And the reason it's very blue is we're looking still top of atmosphere. So we've got the inf the uh, kind of the influence of the atmosphere is, is across all of this image, but it's probably most most obviously severe in this blue part of this scene. Now we can actually use Snap to get rid of some of these. So I'm going to perform a process which Snap can do internally called a Rayleigh correction. So all I'm going to do is remove this blue scattering that the atmosphere is responsible for. So I can get rid of some more of this and I can now start to see with this with this new image that I've created here, a lot more of the activity occurring in the North Sea, all these crazy contrails which are actually really going to get in our way. Uh, when we look at data, but uh, they're quite hard to correct for, but they actually look quite visually compelling as well. And we can also see some of the interesting kind of um, swirls that are occurring in the uh, in the left side of the picture as well in the, in the North Atlantic, some hints of some activity here. Though in practice, this is probably relatively hard to work with. Performing this Rayleigh correction, as I've done, is really only one part of a full atmospheric correction. If we wanted to do the full atmospheric correction, as is done when we create an Alchi Level 2 product, then we start to see, wow, look at all the activity that's occurring in this area. So this is now what happens when we look at the reflectances uh, with the atmosphere completely removed as far as we can do. And we can really see that there is an enormous amount occurring in this picture. It's a fantastic, mostly cloud free image of the North Sea. And there's so much activity here. It would take me another half an hour to explain even like 10 percent of what's happening. But just to show you that um, when you start to look at some of the atmospherically corrected level two data, some of the patterns you see are absolutely fantastic. Most places do not publish the level two uh, reflectances that I've used to create this. So if you want to create pictures like this or look at pictures like this, then you'll have to come to uh, UMETSAT and the UMETSAT data store to get this data to look at these uh, to look at these bands. Now, not to focus so much on ocean color, we can also start to look at sea surface temperature in this. Uh, snap package as well. And I'm just going to show an example I pulled out here of the SST data on the southern coast of Africa around the Agulhas Current, uh, an area I really like working in. Um, you can see the Agulhas Current off the coast here, and you can see the Benguela upwelling system in the cold water here. And you can right click and you can export all of these, including the legends and the color palettes associated with them uh, for use uh, later. You can make very, very good publication quality and um, shareable quality. Uh, GeoTIFF or PNGs in Snap exports them all in very, very high quality, very nicely for you to distribute. And you're working with the fundamental data itself, which means you have total control over how you display it and how you um, and how you manipulate it. And as I said before, it's not limited to just the level two satellite data. We can also import uh, variables from the Copernicus Marine Service. For example, here is a um, an Ostia. Uh, level 4 SST image that I grabbed today for the near real-time SST showing um, across the, the European region. Okay, so I'm going to stop there with Snap. The last part we're going to focus on um, is working in Python. And really, when we get to working in Python, unsurprisingly, everything here is code. 
Um, and uh, this allows you really total freedom to manipulate your data for any visualization you see fit. Uh, considering some of the examples on the left-hand side here, these are animations I made comparing uh, Sentinel-3 and Sentinel-6 data and CMEM significant wave height field with the overpass of uh, Tropical Cyclone uh, Freddy in, uh, in spring or late winter last year. We have collected a load of our ocean code together. Um, it's available at this uh, web uh, URL I've given you, Wekio for Oceans. And we tend to stage our code inside Jupyter Notebooks for ease of use. I'm just going to quickly show you what that looks like. So if I open up my uh, web browser again, if you go to wekio.eu, it will bring you to this front page. If I scan down this front page, then there's a big Get Started Now button, which I'm going to click on. The Get Started Now button will open the catalog of Jupyter Notebooks that are available for you to use on the Wekio cloud system. For those of you who don't know Wekio, it's the Copernicus DAS uh, data information and access service uh, that holds all or pipes in most if not uh, of the UMetsat Copernicus marine data and the Copernicus marine service data, so all together in one place, and provides you with some cloud services that you can use to, uh, to manipulate this data. One of the most uh, important parts for you to want to work with is our Jupyter Hub. And the Jupyter Hub icon, once you've made an account, is available when you click on this little button here. When you fire up Jupyter Hub, you will have access to all of our notebooks. You will start in this folder called public. And inside here, there'll be all Wekio for atmosphere, climate, data, land, oceans, and synergy. And inside the ocean uh, repository, which I encourage you to check, you can find examples of Python code for looking at um, and displaying uh, Ulchi data. So here's an example for uh, showing how you would show uh, Ulchi bands uh, and imagery, gives you some information about how Ulchi works and the bands that are available, and then walks you through step by step some ways in which you can manipulate this data in Python to make images that are appropriate for you. Uh, the same thing is true of SLSTR, the sea surface temperature sensor. Again, here's a kind of an allegorical or a, or a parallel um, notebook to the one I showed for Ulchi. And if I scan down here, then you can see some examples of using SLSTR data both during the day and at night to look at false color uh, images from the thermal infrared bands, um, as well as information from the uh, from the visible so and solar bands and from the sea surface temperature products as well. And most importantly, this will also expose the use of altimetry data, which um, which the Snap package doesn't support. So here is an example animation I've made, and this notebook will walk you through using that uh, of a case study we did last year. And this is the example I showed on my first slide of, uh, of Tropical Cyclone uh, Freddy. And this is overlaid with the Sentinel-3 SRAL altimetry track showing significant wave height. So this one is a relatively complicated and actually links back to uh, UMetsat case study that we publish on a regular basis about the use of our data. And you can find the links to uh, to all this data uh, on, and to the case studies and uh, and the data, primary data itself declared in the notebook. So Python is without doubt the most uh, powerful way, I would say, for dealing with um, Earth observation data, but it certainly has the highest technical bar to be able to use it. If you really want to make things that are um, as best spoke, as specific to your purposes as, as, you, as you want, then I highly recommend learning Python or another coding language such as R or Julia to uh, to do this uh, and here are some other examples that i've made in python of climate stripes of marine heat waves of antarctic ice cover etc that are all made uh, using python as the as the as the tool don't be limited though to these there's way ways you can combine python with stuff downstream just as a quick example here is me piping python into blender to make 3d rendered uh, images of geostrophic uh, speed across the atlantic ocean and or to create um or to add um uh, DEMs, so um, uh, elevation maps in ways that are kind of visualized in 3D. You can put the whole thing into Ray Shader, make these nice little tiles. And actually, you can put Python straight into Unity if you're interested in app-based VR rendering. A bit more advanced, not going to talk about that now. So that was a very quick overview of the four tools that I would recommend you investigate more. If you want to know more about any of these, then you can reach us at our help desk at opsatumetsat.int, as well as if you have any questions on our data. Uh, there are links here for upcoming uh, for our calendar of upcoming training events. If you want more information on any of these software packages, I encourage you to register and to uh, for a, a relevant course, and or to see what um, what is available 
uh, on our calendar. Here are links to our code resources. Um, you'll find some on the Wekio service, but if you look at this gitlab.umetsat.int slash umetlab link, you can find lots more that are not quite so Wekio specific, but uh, you're more than welcome to use. Um, and if you want to see examples of our data in use, then check out our case studies. You can always reach me on BR Love Day on Twitter um, or at this ops at umetsat help desk, uh, sorry, ops at umetsat.int uh, via our help desk. And if you apply for any of our courses, I look forward to seeing you sometime in the near future. Thanks very much. Look forward to taking your questions. Thank you to Ben uh, when he joins us again. I'll thank him <laughs> again in person for that very quick demonstration of all the different things that are available, particularly from our side, you met Sat and our colleagues within the Copernicus ecosystem uh, for data visualization. So this is the, really the end of our workshop. We are already over time. So um, I will just take a quick look at the Slido to see what kind of questions we have. Um, and we can answer a couple of them, but otherwise we will also be able to answer your questions directly on the Slido later and you can check back for the answers. So um, I was just going to look at the most recent ones uh, to see if there's any of that are particularly relevant. Okay, so let's see. So we had someone says about um, informative set of webinars. Thank you very much for the compliment. Where can you contact Ben and the other speakers? Um, so most of them, I think you can probably find relatively easily just online. Um, some of them will have shared their email contacts um, in the presentations. Um, somebody was asking about the presentations earlier. We will, in fact, upload all of those presentations to the GitHub. Um, we'll get the first lot up and the ones that we have so far from webinars two and three in the coming days for you. And most of them have some good um, contact information on them. Um, others are available through Twitter as well, as you saw earlier. Um, let's see. Uh, there was a question about Snap. Does Snap require pre-download of data display to work? Um, yes, this is true. Snap is one of those ones that you have to use. You have to download the data in order to work with it. It does have some embedded um, a facility for actually downloading the data from within the software, but it is something you work with uh, locally on your own machine or on a virtual machine if you have one. Uh, it's not like the viewers that all the data comes with the software. Um, let's see what other questions do we have here. I think a lot of these have been answered, except maybe there was an interesting one, which I thought might be quite a fun one actually to end on. Um, Vittorio here was this green water in Venice. I heard it was from wastewater treatment. Do you have any more news on that? Or could you see it from Sentinel too? Have you had a look? Oh, Vittorio, you're muted. I think I can't hear you. The, the green waters in Venice was obviously every, on everyone's media um, media news outlet was apparently a, re a release of a, um, a tracer by someone not clear because it was never no one ever said who did the release itself. No, it was cloudy on Sunday. So no cloud. No. <laughs> no <it's laughs> the first question everyone had. <laughs> I think this is something that once you've started using this data, this comes to your mind immediately when you see something in the media, you think, oh, can I see that? It's always, you know, there's a ship stuck or there's a spill or there's some event going on. Can we see it from space? And uh, Sentinel-2 is a particularly good instrument for that, as long as it's cloud free. It's a good one. Uh, ben is back, so there maybe there is a couple of questions here for him. Um, could Ben pre-record the usage examples of those tools to share later on? These would be very useful for applications by the users. Ben, do you want to comment on that? Because I know it's something you're interested in doing um, in more detail in the coming weeks and months. Uh, I can do. Um, the working in reverse order, uh, there are full tutorials for all of the Jupyter notebooks, but uh, we do have in our plan uh, a couple of recorded run-throughs of them. You're free to contact me if you're using one and there is any problems, though we use them relatively regularly in our trainings. If you do come to <coughs> any of our Ocean trainings, then we will use those Jupyter notebooks extensively and we can discuss your application and how we retool them for that purpose. Uh, for Snap, you can find the wealth on YouTube, but I'm quite happy to dig out some of the other ones that we've got and um, and host those for Snap guides for how you do various processes. I am working on a QGIS one at the moment, and if you're interested in UMetView, there will be another session on UMetView in the final webinar of this series, um, which will give you more information on the capability of it too. So, yeah. Thanks, Ben. 
I would echo there that um, a lot of the stuff that's being shown and showcased in, in these webinars in general um, is the sort of fundamental basis of or the early parts of what we deal with in a lot in the different trainings that are run. And a lot of those focus more explicitly on specific applications or specific types of software usage. So if this has piqued your interest, I would recommend checking out both our training.umetsat.int website, as well as the one from the Copernicus uh, Marine Service and through Wekio, because that will allow you to take part in much more detailed trainings where we can spend more one-on-one -on -one time working with you with these pieces of software. Okay, other than that, I will, I'd like to give the um, well a round of applause to all our panelists to say thank you very, very much for all your presentations today. And uh, just open the floor to say if there's anything else anybody would like to add before we wrap up the workshop. Okay, well, thank you all very, very much for taking part. And uh, we'll be back again next week with another webinar in this series. And we'll answer any questions you had remaining in the Slido. And of course, please do check out our um, workshop webpage and the GitHub and the YouTube for the um, recordings and the presentations um, of today's session and all the other ones to come. Thanks thank you very so much for participating today. Thank you. Thank Bye. you very much. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.